it seems that I'm recording. I'm not quite sure, but let's let's hope. No, it's, I think as as no, it's like as, as long as you're both co-hosts, you should be able to record. We're recording on this side too, but we're also recording a backup in Audacity audio only as well, just in case we like to quadruple okay. check everything. So okay. uh, last thank thing for, for levels. Thank you for your help. <laughs> No problem. Uh, this is uh, certainly not my first um, Zoom anything. I'm going to, I thought we were over it, but we're not. Okay, so <laughs> just for the audio levels only through Audacity, uh, what did you have for breakfast today? Uh, what I had for breakfast today, I had an apple and a, a pretty oily um, peanut butter bar. <laughs> Excellent. Your levels are great. That's lovely. Uh, so we've got, we're uh, triple locked the, the here. peanut butter wasn't. <laughs> oh, really? I love a bit of peanut butter, actually. Keeps you going for a good one. It does. Um, I'm, it going really to leave, does. I'm going to leave you two to it, and uh, we know that we're happy and we're ready to go. So and everything. Enjoy. And uh, everything's recording. You could actually injure somebody with the book. That was the intent. It's substantial. <laughs> that was the intent. <laughs> You're not moving now, Paula. It's okay, is it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just, I brought the books as well, Sam, just so... I can, you know. Thank you. Uh, it's really lovely to meet you. I can't Thank believe you. it. I'm That's a little mutual. bit star. I'm a, a little bit starstruck, but I, I know you. I know how you get on and talk, and I know Thank there's you. no problem. So yeah, let yeah. us Thank let you. us talk. <laughs> okay, so I I'll, I'll start with your introduction, and then I'll obviously ask you about to start with the definition. So allow me allow me to introduce myself. It's going to be shorter and. I don't want to take too much of the of the of the show uh, on on, okay. on on bragging. I'm uh, I'm Sam Vatnin. I I'll do I'll do I'll do it separately, and I'll, you you go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm Sam Vatnin. I'm the author of uh, *Malignant Self Love: Narcissism Revisited* and many other books about personality disorders. I'm a former visiting professor of psychology, and currently I'm on the faculty of CIOPS Center for International. Uh, they change the name. <laughs> uh, it's a Commonwealth <laughs> Institute. For advanced professional studies in in United Kingdom, Cambridge, Toronto, and Nigeria, they have an outreach campus. So that's me in a nutshell. Yes, and um, your Bible, of course. I'll just, you know, this is the Bible for everybody. Um, yes. Sam, we'll start with uh, your definition of and what is actually a narcissist, and the, maybe the varying types that. You know, you can come across. A narcissist is a person who cannot conceive of other people as separate from him. He cannot conceive them as external objects. He converts everyone around him into an internal object. Everyone significant, everyone meaningful, everyone useful, everyone who can provide him with narcissistic supply, everyone who can fit into his, his shared fantasy. And when I say he and his and him, these gender pronouns are interchangeable. Today, 50% 50 of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder are women. So women caught up in this uh, unillustrious field as well. So when I say he, you can safely replace it with a she. Um, so this is a person who converts everyone into an internal object and then because everyone is an internal object, he feels comfortable, he feels convenient to exploit them, to manipulate them, to use them, to abuse them. Um, he lacks empathy because one does not empathize with one's internal objects and so on. Everything flows, everything comes from this fact that the narcissist is alone in the universe. He is solipsistic. He is the single operating mind. Everyone else is a two-dimensional rendition, a caricature, painting, a drawing, an internal object, whatever you want, a voice, whatever you want to call it. So narcissists treat other people as extensions, as instruments, as objects. And I think that's the best definition of narcissism. There are many others, but I think that's the best one. And you, there's, there's different categories. So there's the overt, the covert. There are, different, and, um, there are different types of narcissists, but today we are beginning to think that we have been, we have committed a serious mistake in the past few decades. Um, until the 1960s, 
narcissism, pathological narcissism, has been perceived as compensatory. The narcissistic person supposedly felt bad about himself, had an inferiority complex, had what we call a bad object, considered himself unworthy, inadequate, a failure, stupid, ugly, you name it. And to compensate for, the, for this internal dissonance, for this dis discomfort, to compensate for this, they, they, these people developed pathological narcissism. They said, I'm not stupid, I'm a genius. I'm not ugly, I'm drop-dead gorgeous. I'm not, I'm not what I know I am. I'm the exact opposite. And they created a false self. This was until the 1960s. And then starting in the 1960s, we began to say, no, there are two types of narcissists. There are compensatory narcissists. Narcissists who don't feel well with who they are. And there are overt, grandiose narcissists. And these overt, grandiose narcissists actually love themselves. They adore themselves. They think they're perfection. They, and so this has, been, this has been the prevailing orthodoxy until recently. But recently we are going back, we are going back to the roots. We are beginning to believe that overt or grandiose narcissists, narcissists who are in your face, they are defiant, they are always happy-go-lucky. They're never wrong. They are, you know, this kind of narcissists we believe are actually psychopaths. And the only true narcissist is a compensatory narcissist, someone who compensates for this bad object inside himself. And now within the compensatory range, we have narcissists who externalize their narcissism. They are ostentatious, ostentatiously narcissistic. And they use narcissism to elicit or to trigger or to provoke reactions in people, which confirm to them their own inflated, fantastic self-image and self-perception. And we call this kind of feedback narcissistic supply. There is another type of narcissist. It's a narcissist who is not very good at interacting with people. A narcissist who constantly fails to elicit praise and compliments and adulation and admiration or even attention. A narcissist who is very bad at securing attention from his environment. And this kind of narcissist is known as a covert narcissist. It's essentially a type of collapsed narcissist. Collapse in narcissism is a situation where the narcissist repeatedly and habitually fails to obtain or secure a regular flow of narcissistic supply. And then if this happens over the lifespan, you become covert. You hide the fact that you're a narcissist. You simply hide it. You act. You, you develop thespian skills. You play act. You pretend. You fake. You develop what we call pseudo-humility, false modesty. You, you become prosocial and communal overtly and ostentatiously charitable and altruistic and moralistic and so on and so forth. These are all covert narcissists. Many, many so-called victims, and definitely the majority of so-called empaths, are actually covert narcissists, in my view. Yeah, you say that you don't even think the empath is a real thing often. You know, a real personality type empath. There's no such thing as empathy. It's not a personality type. It's not a clinical term. It's complete, nonsensical, online hype. And it's actually inverted narcissism. I think it's a form of covert narcissism. Now, inverted narcissism is, is a subspecies of covert narcissism that derives narcissistic supply via an intimate partner who is an overt, grandiose narcissist. So the inverted narcissist teams up with another narcissist, and then she basks in his glory. She, she obtains supply vicariously, by proxy, through him. He's very good. Her intimate partner is very good at obtaining supply. She is not. So she teams up with him. He becomes a kind of provider, but not provider of money, but provider of supply. Think of the whole thing as the economy of a drug. It's actually a drug environment. 
narcissistic supply is a drug. And think about junkies and pushers. So the inverted narcissist is a junkie and her intimate partner is a pusher. The narcissist is a junkie and everyone who provides him with narcissistic supply is a pusher or a source of drugs. It's, it's absolutely comparable to drug addiction. And indeed, you can recast narcissism as a form of addictive, addictive response to um, trauma, oh. early childhood trauma. Yeah. Which we'll touch on in, in a little while. Um, so could you, could you maybe just set out for anyone that's not very familiar with narcissistic behavior and narcissistic abuse, which is one of your own phrases that you coined in the 90s in your book. Um, what type of behaviors would such people demonstrate and what kind of things would you look out for? You know. There's of course a very long list of behaviors. It is a common myth. It is a common myth that you're unable to spot a narcissist because they're great actors. They pull the wool over your eyes. They deceive you. And then much, much later, you find out that they're narcissist and you're devastated. That's a myth. It's complete nonsense. Okay. The minute, the minute you come across a narcissist, your intuition, your gut feeling is that something is wrong. Something is awry. Something is off key. The narcissist is too much in many ways. He's over the top. He's a caricature. He's not a human being. He's a caricature. And... There is a reaction known as the uncanny valley reaction, where we react to people, we react to entities that simulate human beings, we react to them with unease, discomfort. And this is exactly the reaction when you come across a narcissist. So why do people ignore their intuition or gut feeling and proceed with the relationship? Why? Because people, because people are lonely, they're lonely. They compromise. They compromise, they deceive themselves, they're malignantly optimistic, they have pathological hope, uh, shadow the Angelis' phrase. And so they delude themselves into thinking either that their perceptions are wrong, the intuition is wrong, or that somehow with their love and investment and commitment, they may be able to transform the narcissist into... Um, you know, a normal, healthy, loving, empathic, caring, nice, kind human being. Both, both are forms of self-deception. Just one second, please. And Lydia, would you mind closing the door here? Thank you. I'm sorry. I forgot. I forgot. My, my phone. Your, your other half. Yes, my better half. <laughs> my smaller yeah. half, but better half. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so um, we, what are the signs? <laughs> why, why, or what triggers our intuition or a gut feeling? First of all, as I said, they are caricatures. They're exaggerated simulations of human, exaggerated imitations of human beings. You, you see the imitation. It's, it's very visible. It's conspicuous. The fact that they are imitating a human being. Number two. They, they almost have a ghost-like. Sorry? A go they're kind of ghost-like in a way, aren't they? They kind of don't even exist, really. They are like a rendition of a human believe. being. you believe? Yeah, they're like a CGI script. They're like a rendition of a human being. The second thing is, they treat you differently to the way they treat everyone, everyone else. So they treat you nice, nicely. They're very attentive. They're very compassionate. They are emphatically empathic. They are, they are into you completely like a laser beam. They, are, they consume every word you say with astonishment and amazement. And they immediately start to idealize you. And they tell you that you're the most um, fascinating person they've ever met. And that you are so intelligent and so beautiful and so this and so that. And at the same time, they insult the waiter, they shout at the cab driver, they humiliate the next the people at the next table. So when you see a discrepancy between the way you are being treated and the way everyone everyone else is, that's a narcissist. 
The next thing is that narcissists take over. They immediately assume a position of dominance. They decide what movie you're going to see, which restaurant you're going to go to. They take the keys to your apartment and they lock your door. They shove you into the nearest cab. <laughs> they, they immediately monopolize you and the situation. Do not allow you to have any agency, any independence, any decision-making powers, and so on and so forth. These are, these are, and I would say that maybe a fourth sign is inappropriate effect. So you may be discussing something horrible, like, I don't know, the war in Gaza, and they're going to laugh. Their reactions are going to be... Cruelness. Their reactions are inappropriate. So this is another another indicator. There are many, there are dozens. There are so many indicators that it is utterly impossible for you not to notice that you're with someone who is mentally ill. Not impossible not to notice. It's it's possible to lie to yourself, which a vast majority of people do. And so before we start into the, how they go about that. How do, this, at the, how do they actually see the person at the, before we talk about your in you know, uh, the stage setting and all of that how do they actually see that the person the people who they care about or who they're supposed to care about you know the, the, the their loved ones around them do they they don't really see them do they they you have used words which have no place in the narcissist's vocabulary you use, you use you've used words like You've just used words like care and loved ones and so on. This is no place in the narcissist's vocabulary. The narcissist is not interested in who you are. So it is a myth and online, again, online nonsense that narcissists choose intentionally empathic and kind and nice people. They don't, they couldn't care less if you're empathic and kind and nice. They don't care who you are. They care about what you can give them. They care about what they can take from you. And they are focused on four things, which I call the four S's. And that is sex, supply, narcissistic or sadistic. Torturing you is great supply. And um, safety, your constant presence, owing to trauma bonding or addiction or whatever. So supply, sex, safety and services you're supposed to service them in a variety of capacities a chauffeur a personal assistant a cook a mother and so on so the narcissist focuses on whether you can give him two out of these four and if you can he couldn't care less about your traits your beliefs your values your personal history your family your loved ones your nearest and dearest your interests, your vocation, your occupations, your hobbies, your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your, none of this is of any interest to the narcissist. You are like an internet service provider. We want the, we want the internet service provider to provide, with, provide us with reliable broadband, and we don't particularly care about the personality of the people who are working in the internet service provider's office. So you're a provider, you're a supplier, and that's it. And the, 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 they isolate people. These type of personalities, they isolate the, the people, the, the supply. So if they... you are, if you are, so the first thing they do, they convert you in, into an internal object. If you pass the test, if you succeed in the in the job interview and the narcissist believes that you can fit into a shared fantasy and you can provide him with supply and or sex and or services and you're safe a safe person in the sense that you're unlikely to just walk away break up with him abandon him or betray him if he reaches this conclusion your profile fits the pro not your profile but the profile of your what you are able to give him fits then he moves on to the next stage. He converts you into an internal object. He begins to ignore your external existence. He is unable to accept or even to experience your separateness 
and your externality, because as a child, he was not allowed to separate from the mother. He, he never experienced separation individuation. So he doesn't allow you to be, to be a separate person or object. Now, if you are too independent for his taste, if you are too agentic, if you have a modicum of personal autonomy, if you have too many friends, family, a support network, if you are able to secure succor elsewhere, advice, that's a threat. That's a threat to the safety element in the four S's. So in this case, the narcissist would need to constrict your life. The clinical term is constriction. The narcissist would need to constrict your life so as to render you safe. It's not a malevolent attempt to kind of control you and then torture you. No, it's about himself. It's about him, not about you. He wants to feel safe with you. And he cannot feel safe with you as long as you, as an external object, keep conflicting with your representation in his mind, which is the internal object. You need to conform 100% to the internal object. You, the, uh, the narcissist idealizes the internal object. He divorces the internal object from reality. And you need, therefore, to seize your separate existence and to mold yourself, to, to shape yourself in the form of the internal object. And of course, if you make decisions on your own, if, you're, if you have choices which are not influenced by the narcissist, if you maintain reality testing, so you are able to conflict with the narcissist, disagree with him and criticize him, and so on, then you are diverging, you are deviating from the internal object. And you no longer can be considered ideal because you are a threat to the precarious balance in, of the internal landscape of the narcissist. If you challenge one of the internal objects, which happens to represent you in the narcissist's mind, then all the other internal objects are at risk. The principle of introjection is at risk. So you're threatening the narcissist's worldview. The narcissist's perception of reality, which is totally divorced from reality. You're threatening all this. So he needs to get rid of you. He needs to convert you into a persecutory object. From idealization, he switches to devaluation. Of course, the narcissist pushes you to undermine the internal object because he needs to separate from you. He reenacts his early childhood conflicts with you. You stand in for his mother. You're like a mother, maternal object. So he needs to separate from you. And so he needs to convince himself that there's a good reason to separate. And the good reason is you have changed. Something's wrong with you. You're under, you're under bad influence. You have, you have been acting. You've deceived him. You've manipulated him. You're just, I don't know, a gold digger. So... He converts you into a persecutory object, an enemy within, an enemy inside his mind, and then he devalues you. And by any means necessary, but, you know. It, devaluation it, it, it involves. can be very dangerous. Devaluation know. involves um, a recasting or recharacterizing of the internal object in terms of persecution, danger, risk, threat, and so on. And then, of course, he needs to get rid of the threat. And he would go to any extent because the threat is existential. When you challenge the narcissist's internal world, you, be, you, have re you become an existential threat. It's no longer about money or power. It's about his, his existence. Because he can't bear any, any sense of reality. I, 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 yes. I, I listened to you a few weeks ago talking about... Mm -hmm. Before yes, that, reality, that, reality yeah. has not been kind to the narcissist in his early life. And he has chosen as a child to transition from reality to a paracosm, a fantasy world, where there is a deity or a divinity 
with which he merges. And this divinity is the false self. So he becomes a god in a fantastic world. The coping mechanism. It's the only way to survive the extreme environments which breed narcissists. Abuse in these environments do doesn't necessarily mean physical abuse or sexual abuse. Abuse is any situation where the parent does not allow the child to become a separate person, to acquire personhood. The parent does not allow the child to separate, to individuate. The parent does not allow the child to have boundaries. The parent invades and breaches the child's boundaries. The parent merges or fuses with the child. The parent instrumentalizes the child. The parent parentifies the child. And some parents sexually abuse the child or physically abuse the child or verbally abuse the child. But you don't, a spoiled, pedestalized, idolized child is, a, is being abused. These are forms of abuse because the child is denied access to reality and to his peers so he is denied the ability to grow and develop. And he is denied the capacity to become an in individual. So these are all extreme forms of abuse which threaten the existence of the narcissist, of the, of the body narcissist, of the child who is about to become a narcissist. So this kind of child cannot tolerate an environment which doesn't allow him to become. It's an environment that doesn't allow the child to become. An environment that kills the child, assassinates the child, objectifies, instrumentalizes the child. So to escape this, because, because this induces a lot of rage in the child and a lot of shame in the child. And the child is unable to externalize the rage and the shame because mo mother and father are not legitimate targets of rage and shame. So he internalizes the rage and shame up to the point that they threaten his life. So then the child needs to escape, needs to flee this situation. And he creates a very complex fantasy space. Paracosm is the clinical term. Fantasy space. And he populates this fantasy space with something, an entity, which is the exact opposite of the child. The false self, this godlike godhead figure, this divinity, this deity, is everything the child is not. The false self is all-powerful. The child is helpless. The false self is all-knowing and therefore can predict the behavior of adults. The child cannot predict the behavior of the adults in his life. They are capricious, they're arbitrary, they're absent, they are manipulative, they are so. It's terrifying. So gradually the child says, okay, the only way to survive is to merge with my God, to sacrifice myself to this God. It's a primitive religion. The child creates a primitive God, a Moloch, and then the child sacrifices his true self to this God. It's human sacrifice. The child ceases to exist, but reappears as the false self, merges and fuses with the false self, becomes one with the false self. And from that moment on, the child is invulnerable, untouchable, invincible. You can't hurt a God so never mind what you do to the child after the emergence of the false self. He is immune. He is impermeable. He is untouchable. He can never experience pain or hurt or fear or, because he is a god. And that lasts throughout the narcissist's lifespan to the very day he dies. Yes, because you, you, you mentioned that uh, you get l less and less connected as time goes on to that is child it, that you split, would you say it's, it's a split? Would you describe, or would you just say it's hit, the child is hidden into the background? There's no child. The child dies. There's only the false self. The false self survives. It's the only survivor of this mega disaster, this catastrophe, is the false self. The, 
the child disappears into the faucet because the child ju judges this, deems this uh, survival strategy. Completely understandable. Um, you described it uh, a few weeks ago in one of your lectures online, and you said a vacuum that cannot tolerate nature and a mere observer of your own life never present. One day waking up to realise you would never wake up again. Caught in an endless looping silent film, an alternative infinite void existing as a non-entity. And um, so I'm going to go and ask you about the setting up of the stage for you, you developed your own um, from your own framework. Um, you started with Sanders, as you always refer to him, 1989, and you um, developed your own um, your own psychological uh, conceptual framework. And I just wanted to ask you about that. And so you started with shared. You started with Sanders, and then you, in addition to your idea of dual mo mothership. So, yeah, can you tell us all about that? and how you framed it. The narcissist starts off as a child, but then grows up. And as he, as he becomes an adult, at least physiologically, he's obsessed with normalcy. He wants to be like every, everyone else. He wants to be normal, or he wants to be considered normal. An accomplished person, an unusual person, but still normal. He doesn't want to be considered crazy or, you know, mentally ill. So narcissists are very focused on presenting a facade of normalcy. And so what does a normal person do? They find an intimate partner. They have relationships. So narcissists are obsessed with relationships. Much more than, much more so than normal people, than truly normal people, <laughs> truly healthy people. Narcissus is obsessed with it because it's an ostentatious display of normalcy. So yeah, you see, it's like it's like it's like some gay people who are who are egodystonic. They're ashamed of of their sexual orientation. They get married. They get married and say, "You see, I'm married. I have children. I'm not gay." The clinical term for this is reaction formation. You, you create a set of behaviors and you make statements that belie, that defy who you truly are. So if you are a latent homosexual, you would be homophobic. You say, I hate homosexuals, they're horrible. No. But actually, you're doing this to protect yourself, to defend against the shame of being a homosexual in your mind. Similarly, the narcissist defends against the shame of being who he is by pretending or insisting to be treated as normal. And so what's more normal than a relationship? So the narcissist goes around hunting for people, hunting for friends, um, intimate partners, even colleagues and so on. And he tries to elicit from them a confirmation that his false self is not false, that he is not delusion, that his life is not a fantasy, that he is embedded in reality. Reality testing, clinically speaking, is what Freud used to call an ego function. It's a function of the ego. The ego is just a word. There's no such thing, of course. No one isolated an ego in a laboratory. But the ego simply means the interface with reality. When we interface with reality and we get feedback from reality which modifies our behaviors, that's the ego. Narcissus doesn't have this. He has forsaken reality in his early childhood. So he doesn't have an ego. Ironically, narcissists are selfless. They're selfless. Ironic. Yes. They I don't have an ego. Expect that. Yeah. They don't have a self. And so what they do is what we call external regulation. Borderlines do this as well. Borderline regulates their emotions and their moods 
via an intimate partner. So they outsource internal regulation. It becomes external. They externalize regulation. The narcissist does the same, but the narcissist regulates his sense of existence, his sense of self-worth, and his perception of reality via other people. He, his regulation is external. His reality testing is outsourced. So he goes to he goes to other people and he says, I'm a genius, right? Tell me I'm a genius. Of course, his false self is that of a genius. And maybe in reality, he's a moron. But he wants people to tell him that his delusional, fantastic, inflated self-perception, grandiose self-perception, as a genius, is not false, is not delusional, and is not grandiose. It's the truth. He wants them to provide reality testing for him. Same with an intimate partner. When the narcissist finds someone who he deems to be a potential intimate partner, he the first thing he does, he converts her into an internal object and tries to convert her into a source of supply. And he hands over regulatory function to the intimate partner. He tells the intimate partner, from now on, I want you to confirm to me that my false self is not false, that it is reality, that I am truly a genius, irresistibly handsome, whatever. I want you to tell me this. I want you to confirm this to me. But who does this? Mother does this. Mother with a newborn baby, she idealizes the baby because raising children sucks, truly sucks. The only way to survive the process of upbringing and raising children is to lie to yourself, to deceive yourself by idealizing the baby. So what the narcissist does, he says, I want you to idealize me. I want you to tell me that I'm perfect. I want you to tell me that I'm a genius. I want you to tell you, I want you to tell me that I'm irresistibly handsome. In short, I want you to treat me the way a mother treats her baby. I want you to idealize me. And once you've idealized me, I want you to love me the way a mother loves her baby, unconditionally. And now, because I can't be sure. I'm a bit paranoid. I can't be sure whether you're acting, whether you're just manipulating. Maybe you're just telling me what I want to hear. I can't be sure of your motivation and of your identity because I didn't even bother to get to know who you are. So what I need to do, I need to test you. And I'm going to test you by abusing you. If I abuse you egregiously and you still love me, you still provide me with love, that's unconditional love. Then I know that you're a maternal figure. I know that you're idealizing me. I know that you are telling me what I want to hear because you love me. And now we can stay together. So this is the, the core function of narcissistic abuse. It's essentially a test, initially. Later it has another function. But initially, it's a test. And from that moment on, the intimate partner is a maternal figure. It's a mother. It's a second mother. But this leads to a conundrum, to a problem. The narcissist has had a very bad relationship with his original mother, with his real mother. Otherwise, he would not have become a narcissist. So now, there's an intimate partner in a shared fantasy. She com she's compliant. She's submissive. She's obedient. She's obsequious. She tells the narcissist what he wants to hear. She loves him unconditionally, never mind how much and to what extent he abuses her. In short, she's the perfect intimate partner. But she's still a mother. She's still a maternal figure. And narcissists hate mothers because of what the original mother, the biological mother, has, has done to the narcissist. So this creates a dissonance. 
On the one hand, the narcissist needs the intimate partner as a maternal figure. It's, it's a safe environment. He goes back to the womb. He's again a child, loved as a child, adored as a child, treated as a child, cosseted as a child. He's a child, second childhood. Maybe this time it will end well, who knows? On the one hand, on the other hand, it's a mother, this detested, hateful, loathed figure. So he needs to separate from them. What he has failed to achieve with his original mother, he now needs to accomplish with his new mother. He needs to separate from her. And only this way can he become an individual person, acquire a self and a personhood. He needs to sacrifice him the way he has sacrificed himself early on. Now he needs to sacrifice her. And so he needs to devalue her. He needs to push her away. He needs to discard her. He needs to get rid of her. But she is wonderful. She loves him. She cares for him. How can, how can he get rid of someone like that? By devaluing. By telling himself that she is actually an enemy. By converting her idea, the idealized internal object that represents her in his mind. Converting this object into an enemy. A persecutory object. What I'm trying to tell you is that devaluation and discard are not the outcomes of the intimate partner's behavior, choices, and decisions, or traits. No, they have nothing to do with the intimate partner. It's a built-in feature in the shared fantasy. The shared fantasy is built, constructed, to inexorably lead to a reenactment of the of the failed separation individuation with the original mother. It's what Freud called repetition compulsion. Doomed, always doomed. It's always doomed. doomed. Always. But it's doomed, it's doomed because that's the way it's built. The shared fantasy is built to lead to a second attempt at separation individuation, which might work this time. Maybe it will work. So, of course, it doesn't work. And the narcissist keeps repeating the shared fantasy and separation, devaluation, shared fantasy, with multiple intimate partners throughout his life and to his dying day. Possibly in the afterlife. I don't know. I'm not privy to that. Um, yeah, so you have the shared fantasy, uh, then the stage one, idealization. Stage two is the, as you just described, the uh, the dual mothership phase, and um, then stage three, the mental disregard. So I found it interesting, you know, when I was preparing the notes in that, um, in that mental disregard stage, um, it's the separation process by discarding the victim or the person, you know, who is in the relationship with. With the with the narcissist in his mind by creating dissonance, but um, the result of that has two adverse effects for him. So uh, you you note that it um, it's a very difficult psychological process that particular stage, and they have uh, it, it it results in abandonment, anxiety, separation, insecurity, and narcissistic injury. So can you tell us a little bit about that stage and what happens? And yeah, but first I think, um, thank you yes. for reminding me, I need to elucidate a bit the dual mothership also. Yes. Because I've explained how the intimate partner becomes the narcissist's mother. But the narcissist also becomes the intimate partner's mother. The narcissist idealizes the intimate partner. And then he provides her with access to this idealized image of herself. The intimate partner begins to see herself, to perceive herself, through the narcissist's idealizing gaze. She sees herself through the narcissist's eyes as perfect, ideal, amazing, drop-dead gorgeous, hyper-intelligent, unique, and unprecedented. And it's absolutely intoxicating and addictive. I call it the whole of mirrors effect. I love that description. Yeah. 
Yeah. The intimate partner doesn't see the narcissist. She sees herself reflected by the narcissist. And she becomes self-infatuated. She falls in love with herself, not with her real self, not a reality, but with her idealized self. Now, remember what I said about mothers? Mothers idealized babies. The narcissist idealizes his intimate partner, so he feels like a mother. It feels as if a mother is doing this. And the intimate partner regresses to childhood. She becomes infantilized. The narcissist regresses her to childhood so that he can act as her mother and idealize her and love her unconditionally so that she gets addicted to him and to his gaze and will never abandon him. This is the dual mothership. She acts as his mother. He acts as her mother. And this is a good foundation for trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is a form of self-harm. It's self-harming. It's like suicide by narcissism. You know, you want to punish yourself, harm yourself, trash yourself. Narcissism is great at doing all this. He would willingly help you with all this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So It's a kind of his MO. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it fits and, and so on. So, when the devaluation process starts, the narcissist needs to convert the ideal object, internal object, the idealized internal object that represents the intimate partner in his mind. That he has created. That he yeah. has created. He needs to convert this object to the opposite, to a devalued, inferior, threatening, the secretary object, the exact opposite, white and black. This presents two problems. The first problem is the narcissist has to admit that he got things wrong. He has to admit to having having made a mistake. Yes. If if the narcissist idealizes you and then has to devalue you, it means that his idealization of you must have been wrong. So he needs to acknowledge that he is fallible, less than perfect, not omniscient. That flies in the face of his grandiosity and threatens his balance. The second problem is that if the object is the secretary, if the object that represents you in the narcissist's mind is now an enemy, mm -hmm. that means that he has to get rid of you, which he ultimately does. But it also means that he's about to, to, to remain alone. He's about to be left behind. And that's his worst nightmare. And abandonment anxiety, which is the colloquial term, the clinical term is separation insecurity. Separation insecurity or abandonment anxiety, separation anxiety, never mind. These are terrifying to the narcissist and, and to the borderline as well. The narcissist can't contemplate abandonment and, and, and uh, being left alone because he needs an audience. The narcissist has a hive mind. He has an empty core. There's nobody there. He is an absence, not a presence. So the narcissist has to recreate himself on the fly. All the time, every second, he needs to recreate his totality. Like if it stops for a minute, poof, he vanishes. Like a magician's sleight of hand. You know? So he needs to constantly solicit and consume feedback from the environment, also known as narcissistic supply. Otherwise, he will evaporate, fade, vanish, boom. <laughs> so, if he were to be left alone, that would mean his end, his death. So, converting the idealized object into a secretary one, triggers in him existential fear of vanishing. And this is why narcissists immediately find alternatives or monkey branch, they find alternatives before they devalue, because they can't stay for a single second 
without an alternative. This is not about being treacherous or cheating or infidelity or it's none of these things. This is about being seen. The narcissist existence relies crucially and exclusively on being seen all the time. If the narcissist were to find himself in a situation where he is not seen, then he would have ceased to exist. There's a famous painting by Dali, Galatea, where she dissolves into molecules or into bubbles. Same with the narcissist. He needs an audience because it is the audience that forms his existence and his mind. He has a hive mind. He has a compounded mind. It's like the eye of an insect. It's actually thousands of eyes that give the wrong impression of a single eye. But the narcissist is the outcome of input from thousands of sources. And the input is seamless, seamlessly congealed into an appearance of a human being, of a person. And yet there's nobody there. It's crucially dependent on the maintenance of a regular flow of this feedback. In its absence, the narcissist would simply freeze, cease to exist. Imagine, for example, a robot yeah. who is connected to an electricity outlet. If you pull the plug, the robot freezes. The same with the narcissist. The outlet is other people. So... Converting anyone into a persecutory object is a very threatening experience. I think it's probably the most dangerous stage, is it? Would you yes. think, Dr. Backman? Because they, they, they will literally do anything. And then there's the hoovering thing as well that, that can occur often, where they go back and go back. And the inter we'll talk about that as well, the intermittent reinforcement. But they, the hoovering, you know, they can't let go. They're afraid to let go. And they, they go and they torture. The other person might be trying to get away from them. And they just keep going back and torturing them. And they just won't let that that that, that line off, you know. Yeah, they very often it. the narcissist, having, having, ex, having experienced the persecutory object, having experienced the conversion of his intimate partner into an enemy in his mind, yeah. finds the experience harrowing and terrifying. So then what the narcissist does, he re-idealizes the internal object. He, he repaints it, renovates it. And then he tries to match the idealized internal object with the external object that gave rise to the internal object. And this is what we call hoovering. Yeah. And it's, it's, when you think about it, it's like they have abused the person so much with the narcissistic abuse. And then, you know, they it's, it's such a messy uh, type of uh, lifestyle and rela they don't, relationship. They don't say it this way. They don't say it this way. They don't, they don't, they would disagree with you that they've been abusing. First of all, they would say that it is a privilege for you to be with, with, with an, the Nazis would say it's a privilege for you to be with him. You have access to him, which is a gift. You share his life, your witness to his moments of glory and accomplishments. You are privileged. You should be eternally grateful for this amazing serendipity. You know. Second thing, the narcissist would recast or reframe all his behaviors in terms of in terms which are socially acceptable. He would he would attempt to sublimate them. He would say, for example, yeah, I may have shouted at you or verbally abused you. But it was the only way to get through to you, and it was a form of tough love. I was doing it, I was doing it for your own good. You know? So he, he would reframe or rephrase everything. Again, it's the attempt to present a facade of normalcy and benevolence. Normalcy and benevolence. Very few narcissists, there are. There are psychopathic narcissists, also known as malignant narcissists, and sadistic narcissists. They would take pride in bringing you, in taking you down. They would take pride in dismantling you, in destroying you. This is their art form. It's like art, you know. But there's, there's a tiny minority, only about, we, we're not quite sure, but only about 3% of narcissists are either psychopathic or sadistic. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
seek to refute it. He would the psychopath, if you were to confront him with incontrovertible evidence, would fold, fold and go away. Because they know reality. They know reality, yeah. They know, okay, I've tried, I've failed. I tried to con you. I tried to deceive you. I failed. I'm on my way to the next victim. Not the narcissist. The narcissist would stand his ground. He would argue with you. He would dispute your version of reality. He would, you know. And even if you present the narcissist, with incontrovertible evidence, like video recordings or audio, the Nazis would 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 not countenance them, would not incorporate them into a new perception of reality. So narcissism is a fantasy defense. That's a type of psychosis. Would you describe it, it, it as absolutely kind of borders? A... It, it absolutely borders on psycho. It is psycho. The difference between psychotics and narcissists is the direction, directionality. The psychotic confuses internal objects, voices in his head, images in his mind. He confuses these with reality. So if there's a voice in his head that says something, he would, he would think that the voice is coming from outside. If he has an image that passes through his mind, he would have an hallucination. He would perceive the, he would perceive the images coming from from outside. That's a psychotic. The narcissist, and this is called, this is called, by the way, clinically, hyperreflexivity. The narcissist, the narcissist is exactly the opposite. The narcissist would confuse external objects with internal ones. This, the psychotic confuses internal with external. He thinks that internal objects are actually external. The narcissist thinks that external objects are actually internal. But in both cases, there is a massive confusion it's between reality and, 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 and fantasy, or at least between external and internal. So you, call, you can call it reverse psychosis, inverted psychosis, mirror psychosis, but it's psychosis all the same. It's a psychotic state, which is a psychotic state, which is the outcome of a trauma so extreme, so prolonged, so all pervasive and so existential that it led to a dissociative state that didn't have to do with memories, because most dissociation is about memories, but a dissociative state that had to do with reality itself. Whereas people who are traumatized as children sometimes forget uh, traumatic events they repress That's them. Right. Yeah. Yes, they repress them. They forget them. This is amnesia. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a dissociative defense against memories or content that is intolerable, that is unacceptable. So most people, when they're confronted with trauma, would dissociate itself. The narcissist dissociates not the memory of the trauma. The narcissist dissociates. All of reality cuts it off completely because so kind of forgets it. Puts it he out. Doesn't forget, it. He doesn't forget the event. If you were exposed to sexual abuse as a child, you would forget the rape. This is dissociation, and later on you may develop borderline personality disorder and so on. But you would. This is classic dissociation in narcissism but you dissociate the event but you don't dissociate your school days your peers uh, show you have seen on television you, you dissociate only the event only the traumatic locus the event the narcissist on the other hand dissociate dissociates the totality of reality that's why narcissists narcissistic dissociation is so ubiquitous and so all-pervasive that narcissists, I can generalize and say that narcissists have literally no memory, no ability to form long-term memories. And consequently, narcissists are incapable of learning. So they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. What happened, what happened to you then? <laughs> Sorry? You seem, to, you seem to have learned pretty good in life. <laughs> not, that kind, not that kind of learning, <laughs> autobiographical learning. That's a different, different skill, okay. different, uh, different type. Um, 
So they don't learn how to to remember. They don't derive the normal... they don't derive lessons from life because they don't experience life and they don't remember life. Simple. I once made an exercise with myself in the very early stages of my study of narcissism, which was about almost thirty years ago. Now I'm a professor of psychology and so on. At the time, I was just just a guy trying to understand what hit him, you know, what hit me. Yeah. So I'm coming across a convoy of trucks, not not one truck. I believe. Yeah. So I I made a, I did an exercise. I wrote down all my memories from my eight year long eight years long marriage to my first wife. Okay. All my memories. Every single one of them. And then I assigned a time value to the memory. For example, I'm walking down a street. That would be about 15 seconds or 30 seconds. I am opening the, the jacuzzi uh, faucet. That must have been 10 seconds. Like I assigned a time, reasonable time, lap periods to. And I discovered yeah. that if I were to assemble all my memories without a single exception and assign to them reasonable time frames, they would amount put together to about one hour. I remember that I recall one hour out of eight years of marriage to my first wife. That's how bad it is in Nazareth. Okay. I mean, I've come across narcissistic personalities, and I, I, they, they wouldn't remember things that happened last week. And I'd say, sure, do you not remember? They'd have a whole brand new story, maybe, yeah. <laughs> completely remember it differently. So that, that's why they, that's why they confabulate yeah. when you have such gigantic memory gaps. In order to survive, you need to tell yourself, you need to construct a narrative, a bridging, bridging narrative to bridge the memory gaps. You know. You need to ask yourself, here I am at point B. I recall having been at point A. What, ha what has transpired between A and B? I don't remember. I can't remember. I'm dissociative. So I'm going to invent a plausible, probable, reasonable narrative as to what it brought me from A to B. And then I'm going to believe in it. I'm going to claim that it is factual. And this is confabulation. And so That's people are saying, self-styled experts are saying, the narcissist is lying. He's not lying. He's trying to create an autobiography, autobiographical memory, personal memory, out of thin air. That is a real sense of a loss of touch with reality when you describe it like that. When you give that as a they literally have, don't have a connection with real-time reality. The only two conditions, medical conditions, that are reminiscent of this are Alzheimer's and uh, Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome is a medical syndrome. It's a, the outcome of damage done to the brain by excessive consumption of alcohol. So it's the outcome of alcoholism, but excessive alcoholism. So in these two conditions, there's no memory, long-term memory formation because it's damage to the hippocampus. There's no long-term memory formation. And so these people try to make sense of their world and of their existence and of their next next of kin memory, of the last memory. They're trying to make sense of it's terrifying. It's a terrifying feeling. People don't appreciate it, but it's a terrifying feeling. Now people don't understand it. Yeah. And people also confuse this with intellectual memory and with uh, memory that is utilitarian. I'm talking about autobiographical memory. Who am I? My identity is determined by the assemblage and the amalgamation and the aggregation of my memories. If I don't have memory, I don't have identity. People without memory have no identity. So, this is the narcissist problem, but intellectual memory is something completely different. I'm in possession of an encyclopedia in my mind. 
not only Literally. psychology. I, I, I do work in physics and in economics and in philosophy. I have other personalities that you're not aware of. So I have a whole encyclopedia in my mind. I know of them. I have a whole encyclopedia in my mind. So my memory, when it comes to intellectual things, is actually possibly one of the best, unparalleled maybe. I think Similarly, when I listen to you, and you know, you, sometimes you don't even have notes, it seems, and you just, you just. Yeah, so the, the and... intellectual memory is intact and even superior yeah. to some extent. Similarly, yes. similarly, other types of memory, utilitarian memory. I need to remember the balance in my bank account. I need to remember something you've done to me so that I can use it against you. I need, these are utilitarian memories. They're intact. The narcissist's utilitarian memories are intact. Thank God. Survival. These are memories that are conducive to survival. There's a tiger, you know, the tiger. So these memories are intact. It's the autobiographical memory, the thread, the thread, the crimson thread that connects our memories like beads, like a necklace. This necklace is who we are. Indra's net. These beads put together are who we are. If I were to take away all your memories, or most of them, they wouldn't be you. You could still remember, by the way, when we when we come across people with traumatic brain injuries and so on, they can still read a newspaper, they can calculate, they can watch movies, they, they can do many things. They can dance, they can enjoy music. They just don't remember who the hell they are. They don't know anything about themselves. So these are different types of memory. People, people get very confused because they, it's not true that the narcissist has memory problems. He remembers everything I've done to him. Yeah. Or they say he does gaslight. They do gaslight. Wait, they don't so, yeah, or they do gaslight. It's, it's that the narcissist is an organism like every other organism. Organisms maintain memories that are useful to them. A tiger would maintain memories where antelopes convene <laughs> by the water, you know. These are... But a narcissistic tiger wouldn't have a memory of his own identity, which is not very helpful in the jungle. No. <laughs> no, um, that's fascinating. I didn't actually realize that, but that's something I didn't know that I learned today about the memory. That's unbelievably debilitating but it makes sense because of the whole trauma element you know that and that happens with people who have deep trauma their their memories are when you're bad. sexually abused when you're sexually abused yeah. the integrity of your body is challenged but nothing else just the integrity of your body when you are verbally abused some elements of self-esteem and self-worth are challenged but nothing else is shown when you are brought up in a totally abusive environment, a total environment of abuse, everything is challenged. Every aspect of you is challenged. Even your own separateness. Even the fact that you're separate. Even the fact that you're an entity. Even your boundaries. Even your ability to become, to transform, to grow, to develop, to evolve. The, all this is challenged. So you need Locked. to cut off the totality of the environment. You need to get rid of the whole environment. That's why narcissistic abuse, which is a reenactment of early childhood abuse, narcissistic abuse is total. It's not like verbal abuse or psychological abuse or physical abuse or financial abuse or legal abuse. No, it's total. That's why, that's why I came up with the phrase narcissistic abuse, because it is distinct from other types of abuse. Other types of abuse are dimensional, goal-oriented, and highly specific. Narcissistic abuse is about making you vanish. It's about negating your very existence in separateness. It's about denuding you, denying you your autonomy and agency and self-efficacy. Narcissistic abuse is about mummifying you the same way Norman Bates mummified his mother in Psycho, the famous Hitchcock movie. It's about mummifying you like ancient Egyptian mummy and also mummifying you like a mother. It's about converting you into someone you've never been before. Absconding, absconding with your identity. 
rendering you, rendering you an abstract, an, a figment, an idea. It is so, it is so obliterating that it, it merits a separate classification, separate taxonomy. Ascetic abuse is not like any other kind of abuse. The narcissist does to you what his mother did to him. He doesn't allow you to separate the way his mother did not allow him to separate. He abuses you narcissistically the way his mother abused him narcissistically. He does to you everything. He is absent and he's dead the way his mother was absent and dead. He just replaces childhood with you. And you are a statist, You're just an actress playing the role of a mother. That's as simple as I can put it. But to, yeah, but to the absolute detriment of the, 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 the person who gets involved with somebody who is of course, you know, it's, deep uh, into a narcissistic Christmas. It's devastating because the narcissist... It destroys people. Yes. It's even worse than destroying people. People are destroyed by many things. People are destroyed by wars and natural disasters. It's much more than destroying people. It's taking over. It's hijacking you. The narcissist uses a technique called entraining. Again, not intentionally. The narcissist entra entrains you. He kind of hypnotizes you or he synchronizes your brain waves with his brain waves. By the way, actually synchronizes your brain waves with his, his brain waves. He subjects you to cataracts, to to cataracts or, or of of dopamine and, and you know he, he he plays with your mind and then he takes the over your mind and he he installs in your mind a voice an introject that never goes away. Intermittent reinforcement is a way to condition you to change, to alter your perception of reality. It's a form. Intermediate reinforcement is about convincing you that only the narcissist is the source of good feelings, of positive emotions, of the ability to be loved, and so on. So when the narcissist abuses you and hurts you, hurts you, tortures you, and so on. You keep saying to yourself, maybe he's doing this to me right now, but this is going to be followed by another phase where he is going to be the addictive source of the most amazing love and, you know, enmeshment. So the narcissist renders himself as the indispensable exclusive source of your well-being. He is able to take it away, but it is because he's able to take it away with his abuse that he's the only one able to give it back to you. He convinces you that your well-being is an object, so he can take it away, and then once he has taken it away, he owns your well-being. And then the only way to get it back is to stay with him. Because one of these days he will give it back to you, your well-being. He convinces you that your well-being is a commodity and you're a commodity. And so your well-being, once it had been transferred, you can never regain it elsewhere. It's like he has a monopoly on your well-being or it's a, he takes it away from you. Yeah. And your thought process, your autonomy, your sanity, you know, um, if, 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 if you're told black is white, you know, in those situations, you'd, que you'd actually question that reality at, 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 the, at the higher levels of the abuse. You know, you'd actually the fantasy, say, oh, maybe it, maybe it the is fantasy, black. Fantasy caters to your deepest psychological needs. And the narcissist is something which I, 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 coined, I coined the phrase called empathy. The last is yeah. called empathy. Called empathy is a combination of reflexive empathy and cognitive empathy. The narcissist is able to scan you in the in the introjection process when he he is in the process of converting you into a snapshot, snapshotting you, uh, yeah. rendering you an internal object. At that point, he scans you, 
And when he scans you, he's able to create a map of your vulnerabilities, the chinks in your armor, intrusion points, weaknesses, hot buttons to push. And so he uses all this information to create a new dependency and an addiction via operant conditioning, Pavlovian, basically. You become addicted to him. Not to him, you become addicted to what he can withhold. You actually are not addicted to what he gives you, but you are addicted to what he withholds from you. And so at that point, you will have lost any separate existence. He, he eliminates your separateness. He targets your separateness. You will have lost any separate existence. You will have become his extension or his sure. subject in a way. And, like a uh, shell. Sorry? Like a shell. Just a shell. Yeah, well, the inner experience of who you are is much diminished. You feel zombie-like. Mm -hmm. You feel that you are controlled from the outside, a bit robotic. Uh, you definitely have no agency or self-efficacy anymore and so on. It all depends on him. So he becomes yeah. also the only conduit and the only channel to the outside world. You outsource ego functions to him. He regulates your reality testing. He, he uh, kind of controls your sense of self-worth and self-esteem. He tells you what's wrong and what's right. So he's your moral compass and so on. And projects, the, the, the projection. So he, can you explain that a little bit? I always find that difficult to understand, but... Projection is kind of pushed, when you have when pushes. you part. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, no, when you put when he pushes there, or they push, you know, negative things about themselves onto you. Isn't that basically? Everyone push. does that. All human beings project. When we are faced with parts <laughs> parts of ourselves that we yeah. feel uncomfortable with, or ashamed of, parts of ourselves that we reject, they don't sit well with our self conception. What we do with these parts, we tend to attribute them to other people. And that's a normal, very common defense mechanism. It's a primitive defense yeah. mechanism, but it's common. And so Narcissus does the same. He attributes to you the part in, parts in himself that he finds unacceptable. So if he's weak, you're weak. If he's avaricious, you're greedy. If he's hateful, you're hateful. If he's abusive, you're the abuser. If he's being abusive, you're the abuser. So this is projection. But Narcissus go combine projection with two other defenses. And that what make, that's what makes narcissistic abuse a really, really devastating force. Devastating experience. Okay. Narcissus combine projection with splitting. So all bad, all good. I'm all good, the narcissist says. That makes you all bad. Or maybe we both are all good in the shared fantasy. We're both idealists. You're both all good. And everyone else is all bad. So this creates like a psychosis, a folie de shared psychosis. Both of us are against the world. The world is all good. We are both. Yeah. <clears throat> the world is all bad. We are both all good. So splitting. And the most devastating, the, mo the most potent and and ruinous defense mechanism of all is known as projective identification. It's when the narcissist projects onto you parts of himself that he finds unacceptable, burdensome, intolerable, shameful, parts of himself that he feels... But we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, go, we go. We'll, go, we'll go through the projection for like a few more minutes, then just um, maybe just have a... Yeah, I was... I was, um, I was cut off when I was trying to explain projective identification. Projective identification is a third mechanism. And yeah. it is when the narcissist projects onto you the parts of himself that he feels ashamed of, that he rejects, that uh, he finds intolerable and uh, egodystonic, uncomfortable. So he projects okay. those onto you. He attributes to you these traits and behaviors, and predilections of his, but then he forces you, he coerces you to behave in a way 
which confirms his projections. So, for example, if he is an abuser and he feels uncomfortable with the fact that he's an abuser, he would say, you're abusing me. I'm not abusing you. You're the one who is abusing me. But then he would provoke you and trigger you and push you to actually abuse him so that his contention that you are the abuser is validated and proven. So this is called projective identification. And narcissists use all these three, projection, splitting, and projective identification. And I think that for people who are victims of, or you know, survivors of uh, narcissistic relationships, I think that is probably the most damaging, you know, part, uh, you know, because I think often in, in times, if I'm correct, that, you know, uh, people in these relationships who aren't narcissists actually be t be have to almost um, take on narcissist these narcissistic characteristics in order to survive it, if they do. And, um, you know, that it's, it's a very sad because, um, you know, it, it makes people into something that they weren't actually. Yeah, by, that's quite by the force of... It, that's quite right? true. By the force... Yeah, by yeah. the force of nature of, of the narcissistic projection and the need to project onto, you know, the other person. His, usually the bad traits. <laughs> yeah. That's quite true. And that's why... And make very, themselves... That's why it's very difficult to tell apart. And make... Yeah. Would you like to finish your statement? <laughs> I'll wait patiently. Yeah. And make make themselves kind of... Uh, put themselves as the good, the good angel and you know, the person they're actually in relationship with as the, the devil, on you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, I think that's the, that's, that's a terrible situation to find yourself in, 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 a, in an intimate partner relationship where you're constantly being made into the bad cop and, uh, you know, and be manipulated into the, into that uh, personality that doesn't even really belong to you, you know, if, if, that, if you find that. So I think that's yeah, a very that's difficult right. thing to deal that's with. Why, that's why I keep saying that narcissistic abuse is about negating you. It's about con transforming you into something you've never been before. It's about take, absconding with your identity, hijacking you, and so on and so forth. Um, this is why it's very difficult to tell apart people with CPTSD, complex trauma, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, people who have suffered for a long time in narcissistic relation, not, relationships with narcissists, it's difficult to tell about these people from people with borderline personality disorder. Excellent. And there are even calls by Judith Herman and, and many others to eliminate or abolish the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and to replace it with emotional dysregulation, which is post-traumatic. In short, the profession now is considering the possibility that what we used to call personality disorders are actually acquired acquired behaviors under conditions of trauma or post-trauma. And so therefore many victims behave the same way that narcissists do, or even become a bit psychopathic um, as a survival, survival strategy or survival mechanism. Luckily for victims, luckily for victims is these are transient phenomena. And so with proper therapy and with a lot of self-work and shadow work and what have you, inner child work and every other kind of work, <laughs> then ultimately um, victims tend to recover their original identity and shed, shed narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors and traits. But throughout this process, the narcissist's voice is inside your head, is introject, is lodged firmly in your mind. He has hijacked your mind and he turns your mind against you. He collaborates with other voices in your mind that tend to disparage you, or discourage you, or criticize you. So if you've had a mother, for example, who's been overly critical and over, overprotective, then the narcissist's voice in your head would tend to collaborate with her voice in your head. And they would form a coalition, a coalition against you. So you, there's a, a situation of a Trojan horse, a fifth column. The narcissist, even when the narcissist is long gone physically, he's still there, he's still in your mind, still speaking to you, 
still putting you down, still criticizing you, still berating and demeaning and degrading you. It's very difficult to get rid of this introject because the process of entraining is almost the exact equivalent of hypnosis and brainwashing, if you wish to use a non-clinical term. And Guantanamo Bay. It's the reversing this is a lot of work. A lot of work. We know, for example, that the success rate with classic PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is 30%, 30. Another 40%, never mind the therapy used, 30%. Another 40% recover partially, and 30% 30, 30 never recover. Yeah, now, I the think that's the very sad part. The narcissist it's abuse, yeah, it's, it's more than sad, it's frightening, I think. The narcissist abuse is not PTSD. It's complex trauma, which is distinguishable from PTSD. And so the prognosis is a bit better. But the fight is uphill, and the voice in your mind never lets go. And it's you're, you're sometimes compelled, self-destructively, to perpetuate the abuse on your own. You self-gaslight, or you... You self-criticize or you self-defeat or so sometimes you just want to give up you want to give in to this voice and validate it and justify it by ruining yourself and sabotaging yourself and it's been developed that habit has been developed if you're in a long-term relationship with somebody yes. so exposure it's... exposure is critical but even exposure of one hour is sufficient to damage you. Even exposure, even extremely short exposure is sufficient to damage you. It's the trauma, it's mini trauma, it passes after a few days and so on, but it's sufficient to damage you. It, it provokes powerful defense mechanisms such as repression. So you are defending against something which is threatening, very threatening. And I'm talking even after, after one hour of exposure to an analysis let alone one year, one decade. That's why the only solution is to, to walk away, no contact. I was just going to say that, that is your advice, is just uh, no contact, full stop. Yes, all the yeah. attempts to manage the narcissist, to heal the narcissist, to collaborate with the narcissist, to co-opt the narcissist, to strike an agreement with the narcissist, to contract with the narcissist or some kind of alliance with the narcissist, to collaborate or cooperate with the narcissist. This all nonsense. And it's all, it's all playing with fire. You need to walk away because the narcissist's damage is subterranean, is subtle, is not discernible, is not visible, it's not conspicuous, rarely ostentatious. Narcissist, narcissist is like slow-acting poison. It's in the atmosphere, it's ambient. And if you don't walk away, your defenses are going to crumble. And you're going to emotionally dysregulate. And you're going, you're functioning, will, you become dysfunctional. Everything will collapse, the center will not hold. You have to walk away. Don't think that you are strong enough to cope with the narcissist. Don't believe that whatever you give the narcissist, including love and compassion and empathy, will do the trick. Don't be grandiose. You are not you are not a worthy adversary for the narcissist. No one is. And Sam, the reality is is that when you when that can happen to people and it does happen so often, the narcissist in the relationship will just walk away anyways because it's done its job. It's 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 provided him with a sense of reality, you know, and it's even better if the person crumbles. They want you to be destroyed because they can walk away. And that's the cruel element to it too. They don't want you to be you know, destroyed. That's... They don't want you to be destroyed, but they want to get rid of you. And the process yeah. of getting rid of you is destructive to you because you've been emotionally invested in the shared fantasy and develop a set of beliefs about that person that prove to be wrong. You lose your self-confidence, your, your trust in your ability to judge people properly, yes. your trust in interpersonal relationships and 
and your trust in cosmic justice and everything everything is the foundations are shaken but there is a grandiose there's a lot of grandiosity involved on the part of the of typical victims and survivors because they somehow convince themselves that they're going to be the ones who survive this they're going to be the ones who prevail they're going to be the ones who got away who made it no one gets away no one makes it even if you think you've made it years pass and you think you've prevailed you're victorious you have tamed the narcissist you have exposed him as cowardly and submissive and what have you even if you think this way you're deluding yourself he's waiting in wait he's ambushing you and he's ambushing you not always physically he's playing with your mind and he's playing with your mind not necessarily intentionally so he can't even stop it it's totally an automated process it's like falling falling prey to some machine that is inexorable and goes on and on and on and there's no switch no no off switch you don't want to get near the narcissist you don't want to experiment with this you don't want you don't want to see if what i'm saying is true no absolutely. you just want to walk away just walk away yeah and, and you, you walk away you walk away the minute you feel uncomfortable you're on a first date you open the door he's he stands there framed by the by the door frame and you look at him and something feels wrong something feels off key something feels awry it's an uncomfortable feeling because he's smiling and he's good looking and he's charming and he's amazing and he's he, he's, he's carrying a bunch of flowers and you know and you say to yourself how can i reject him now based on what it's a first date i don't even know the guy but you should listen to your intuition and slam the door in his face and in his flowers face you just don't let him into your life him or her into your life if your gut instinct tells you that something is wrong something is wrong and if your gut instinct is wrong it's not a big loss there are many fish where no. this fish came from yeah and it's the it's the insidious nature of where where it all starts and uh, you know you, then you, it, it just it crescendos on and suddenly you know the person that's involved can't has no way out or so they think but you know there's a, the, the grip the the death grip of a narcissist um, yeah there's also something you know, called the sunk sunk cost fallacy the sunk cost fallacy is to say to yourself i've invested so much in this relationship yeah. you know it's i've wasted seven years of my life or i i have so many hope i've had so many hopes and dreams and i i've input money and effort and love and so this is called the sunk cost fallacy good money after bed you buy you buy a stock and it goes down so you buy more rather than getting getting rid of the stock of the shares you know when when your investment or speculation go go wrong you get rid of them you don't double you don't double on them so if a relationship goes sideways or south you just call it off you don't redouble your efforts. It's a wrong gambling strategy. I think you used it to say detox, go and deep, just walk away. You used the, the, the term detox recently in one of the videos. Yes, you need to detox because narcissists, as I said, they infiltrate your mind, they hijack it, it's intoxicating, it's habituating, there's a habit involved. You also fall in love with yourself. When you give up on the narcissist, it's a process of multiple mourning. It's prolonged grief because you grieve the narcissist. You grieve the person you thought would be your life partner. Then you grieve yourself in the relationship, the way the narcissist has, has given you access to your idealized image, the way that he has triggered in you 
self infatuation and self limerence and self love. You grieve that. Then you grieve the child. The Gnostic is a child. And so you bond with this child. Maternal instincts exist even in men, not only in women. You bond, it's, you become protective, you become, you know, love. It, it's, it triggers love. And so you, you mourn, you grieve over this child uh, that you, you've interacted with uh, in the narcissist's adult body. You grieve the dream and the fantasy you've had together. Narcissists are great at creating a kind of cult, cults, one-man cults, and they're the cult leader and they're the cult follower or member. The cult has a narrative. You grieve that too. You grieve the fact that you have to exit back to the glaring sun of reality. And reality is never as enticing and as thrilling and as amazing and as spectacular and technical as the fantasy is. You, gr you grieve the broken promises. There's a lot of grieving involved when the relationship with the narcissist ends, much more than when a normal relationship ends. And heartbreak in a normal relationship is a major trauma, major pain. pain. So even, even in a normal relationship, heartbreak is just about the worst thing that can happen to you. Now imagine, imagine this magnified 10 times because of the multiple layers of grieving involved. And this is when you end the, the relationship with the narcissist, you're trapped in a cycle of grieving and self-grieving that you can't extricate yourself from. And sometimes you say, well, the only way is to go back. And this is self-hovering. You hover yourself. You convince yourself that you've misjudged the narcissist. That whatever has happened was circumstantial. Circumstances have changed, so now it's gonna, not going to happen again. Or that perhaps you have expected, you've been expecting too much. Maybe if you, modif if you were to modify your expectations, render them more modest and realistic, things will work out, and so on. You self-hover. You, you do, the, you do the, the job for the Nazis. And so many people come back. And if they don't come back to the original narcissist, they find another narcissist. So it's very, very common for victims of narcissistic abuse to have gone through three, four, five relationships with narcissists, even though they have become fully aware after one relationship. It's just that narcissism or being with a narcissist is an addictive experience. And victims of narcissistic abuse become junkies, junkies for the abuse. Abuse is addictive for multiple reasons. So they become junkies and they seek the next abuser and the next abuser and the next abuser. Freud called it repetition compulsion. Oh yes, you mentioned that. So I want to ask you just a couple of questions as well before we go, because we've only a few more minutes, Sam, even though I spend the day to open to you happily. Um, so, um, I wanted to ask you just, are you religious at all? And do you ever find moments when you can reach beyond, you know, the false self or do you ever, do you do that at all? Have you, do you pray? Do you have any connection with any higher power? Ever? I consider such beliefs or even suggestions as a form of mental illness. Okay. It's known as delusional disorder. Regrettably, religions have a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of political power, especially in countries such as the United States. So we are not at liberty to diagnose religious people when they should be diagnosed with delusional disorder, probably should be medicated as well. Religions, most religions have been established by mentally ill people. And uh, only feeble-minded, the feeble-minded, the weak, the constitutionally weak, and the mentally ill um, have to resort to deceiving themselves with utterly infantile nonsense, such as God or angels, or I don't know what other idiocy props up in these circles. That the vast majority of the population are stupid and weak and feeble-minded and mentally ill is a well-known fact. That's an unfortunate fact, but it's still a fact. 
Maybe it's a politically incorrect fact, but it is a fact. So religion caters to these vulnerabilities, to the great rejoicing of, of all kinds of preachers and priests and who thrive financially as well on this. They they laugh all the way to the to multiple banks as they abscond with people's savings and and emotions and, and so on. I regard religion and even not institutional religion, but the very belief in such nonsense is an exceedingly pernicious phenomenon. I am not an atheist in the sense that I cannot say conclusively whether God exists or doesn't exist. I think the question is preposterous and ludicrous because there's no way to answer it ever in principle. So that's my that's my gentle response, non-abrasive response. You can imagine when I'm abrasive. I sure can, Sam. <laughs> um, so I think we have the we have to have the last question, and um, I'll ask you either about the hookup culture that you did, you you discuss, or um, otherwise, um, the, the the record of narcissistic personality types how they've been recorded and there's higher levels. I know you spoke to Michael Schellenberg very recently about trying to um, use all of this rise in narcissistic um, behavior in a, in a good way. I thought that was very interesting. Um, but I'm the, not sure, I'm not sure what the question is, sorry. So I go, do you know what, I'll ask, sorry, Sam, I'll edit this myself, I don't mean to be. Um, so, You've spoken about the hookup culture and the damaging effects of it and, and, and its rise in society. You seem generally sad about the situation and urge women to come back. And as men, that, men, we, that men need us. You describe a vast number of women as being men with vaginas. Do you think that feminism has become completely distorted? And in your opinion, have women paid too high a price? And what is the price men have had to pay? Or do you think that they are not rising to the challenges that are confronting them at this point? As in, they are finding it very difficult to accept and adapt to the changes that have been brought about and instead are preferring to hide out? This, of course, merits uh, a, whole, a whole talk. It does, really. In itself, yeah. but in a nutshell, I think yeah. changes in uh, mainly in technology have rendered muscle power less needed, or even I would say obsolete. And what men have been bringing to the table all these millennia was muscle power, basically. There's no, there's no difference between brain power between female brain power and male brain power. But there is a substantial difference in muscle mass between men and women. And this constituted the competitive or relative advantage of men over women, allowed them to dominate women throughout, at least since the start of the agricultural mm -hmm. age. And now this is no longer needed. Most, most economic value added nowadays has to do with brain power, or, or with the ability to connect and interact empathically with other people, the helping profession. And both these women are either equal to men, brain power, for example, or they're superior to men when it comes to networking. So in the new economic technological environment, women have an edge. And so we are marching towards a matriarchy. I think it's inevitable that within 50 years, 100 years, maybe less, women will be in charge. Men have nothing much to offer anymore to the world. Women will be in charge. Now, men are not taking this lying down. They are very angry and resentful about this. Whenever power changes hands, the old is pitted against the new. And so men don't know how to behave in this new environment. Either they withdraw and become avoidant. Things have been happening a lot, yes. And they're missing in action. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in education, men are avoiding education. They, and women today are 
constitute the majority of academic degrees in the world. Or men become aggressive and violent, toxic masculinity as it is known. But there's no middle ground right now. There's no consensus among men how, on how to behave, how to counter what they perceive as a threat of a feminine takeover of the world. So men are lost. And I don't think they can prevent this historical trend of a female takeover. Women, on the other hand, have committed a series of pretty catastrophic mistakes in their ascendance. First of all, they have allowed their bitterness as victims of men, and women have been victimized by men for millennia. But they've allowed this bitterness to dictate their new consciousness and their new agenda. Revenge is never a good policy prescription. You could ask Nelson Mandela. It's never a good idea. And women are vengeful and hateful nowadays. It's payback time. For many women, it's payback time. The second mistake, rather than come up with a feminine model of how humanity should be, the way men have come up with a masculine model in the past, rather than do this, Women have adopted the masculine model. So women want to be, want, women, women want to out men men. They want to be more masculine than men. They don't want, for example, to introduce an alternative of empathy and compassion and networking and cooperation and collaboration, which women are very strong on. They don't want this. They want to be ambitious. They want to make money. They want to subjugate and the men. They want to punish the men. Me Too movement. They want to, you know, women became as violent and aggressive as men. And this is not some vaccine. These are studies by Lisa Wade and so on and so forth that show that women nowadays have a totally masculine, masculine self-image. That is a disastrous mistake for women. That they have chosen to become men is a disastrous mistake for men and women. And the third mistake is that women want it all. They want to be mothers. They want to be bosses. They want to be employees. They want to be scientists. They want to. Women refuse to accept a trade off. There is a trade off in life. If you are pursuing a career, you're very unlikely to find a lifelong intimate partner and to have children. It's a fact. It's if, on the other hand, you choose family and home as your vocation or a vocation, then you're very unlikely to prosper in a career. So, for example, the whole debate about wage equality is nonsensical because it represents women's perception that they should have it all. They should have a wage equal to men, but not put in the same number of hours or days or years as a man, because they're raising yes. children. You know? yes. Women have to accept that in everything in life has a cost. There's no free lunch. They have to accept this. And these are the three catastrophic mistakes of third and fourth wave feminism. I don't know how we, we're going to recover. There's no doubt in my mind that women will be in charge shortly. But what kind of women? Ugly women vengeful women, hateful women, sadistic women, narcissistic women, psychopathic women will be in charge. And then may I ask, what would be the difference between this kind of regime and the previous regime of men? These would be just men with vaginas. I say that today there are two types of men, with penises and with vaginas. There are no women anymore. Or at least no women that matter. Yeah, I mean, I I do think that, that there has been a loss of identity. I don't know if you'd call it identity, but, you know, women have certainly either lost or given up or compromised their femininity. You know, that's, I would agree with that. And um, 
you know, I'm I'm not, I don't say I'm a feminist. I'm not, because I, I think even to say that says that I need to be or something or, you know, I, I do believe in men and women and their roles and, and not just their traditional roles, but their, you know, their masculine and feminine roles with each other. And I, I do believe that that we've turned a, into, we've made a bad turn here. And um, I think it's, we are seeing it playing out, you know, with the the childless, childlessness rates and, and the people who are living singly. So, so many of, of us, particularly, I think 30, you said of about 30% live singly all their life and 40%. 40 so like we're seeing, we're seeing the, the results of it. And I, yeah, I'd, I'd be leaning on your side with, I think it's a bad thing for us all. I think it's a private yeah. case, a private case of a much bigger, much larger and much more threatening phenomenon. And that is the sacrifice of synergy for victimhood. We no longer seek synergy. We no longer seek to work together, to collaborate. We no longer pursue agendas and goals, uh, which are common commonalities. We seek to be victims. Even feminism is a victimhood movement, of course. Me too is definitely a victimhood movement. These are victimhood movements. So today, if you're faced with the option to work, even with your former abuser, work together towards a common goal. Even if you were in charge, you would dump all this. You would give up on all this just in order to acquire a victimhood identity. This is competitive victimhood. All victims compete in a limited victimhood space. Who is more victim than the other? Now men are claiming to be victims of women with some justification. So. Victimhood is now the organizing principle, not dignity. Campbell, the famous sociologist, said that we've transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood. But I think the situation is even much worse than this. We've transitioned from the age of collaboration or cooperation to the age of victimhood. Adversarial, adversarial victimhood. Hateful victimhood. Victimhood which seeks to eliminate the other. And this is not sustainable. Species-wise, so sustainable. We're not, we're not gonna survive this. We're not. You see, for example, dropping dropping replacement rates. In other words, population is dying, dying off in the, in many, many countries. In uh, Japan is 25% people are over the age of 65. They're dying. And Japan is not an exception. China is heading there soon. We are, we are short anywhere between 200 and 300 million children. We are short. There's no overpopulation. There's overpopulation of old people like me. We are short. In the young end, we are very short. It's a de deficit, an enormous deficit. We are dying as a species. We are committing suicide. But it's very slow and glacial, so no one is paying attention. And there are still many people around because of medicine. Medicine keeps us alive artificially. You know, I should have died 20 years ago. I'm still alive. So, but this is, this is a delusion. This is self-delusion. Self and, and of course, with the technology as well. I mean, in Japan, you mentioned Japan. Or, or I think an, an awful lot of young people under the age of 30 barely have had a date. Like, it's yeah, that bad the, that they spend so much the time. The study there. published in South Korea two days ago, uh, about 60% said they, they have every intention to never have a relationship. 60% of young people under age 25 never have an intention to have a relationship. That's 60%. 80% said they would never get married. But there's no... The other, the other is perceived as a nuisance or a threat. Other people are perceived today either as nuisance or threat. Not as a delight, not as a wonder, not as a miracle, not as something that opens you up and causes you to grow up and evolve and develop. No. Other people are perceived as taking your time, bothering you, disturbing you. That's in the best case. In the worst case, they want to take you down. They're your enemies. They are they compete for your job. They, you know. So there's little incentive to interact with other people. 
Society is disintegrating and technology is reflecting this. Our technologies nowadays are solipsistic. I always give the example of a screen. When I was growing up, which is when the last dinosaurs were dying, when I was growing up, we had this huge screen and 2000, 2000 of us were sitting in front of this screen, eating popcorn and sharing the same image on the screen. This was known as cinema. Then 20 years later, there was another screen. And, but this time it was a much smaller screen. So only 20 people could watch it and share the popcorn and the experience, the content. And this screen was known as television. And then there was another screen. And this time only two or three people could sit opposite this screen, facing this screen and sharing popcorn and a common experience. And that was the computer. And today we have a screen where only one person can have any experience, and that is the smartphone. The screens are metaphors of what has happened to us. We used to be communities of 2,000 people. Now we are communities of one. It's as simple as that. Let's call it a day here. Agree. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'd say what you, I'd say talking to you all day. <laughs> um, I think yeah, I have such a good time for you, and I am. Um, I really thank you for really having me. I appreciate time it. Today. Yeah, I really, really do, and um, I'll be in touch, and we'll hopefully um, we'll do something again next year. And um, but My I've pleasure. just been so happy to meet you. Yeah, really happy to meet you. And thank you. Um, it's mutual. Have a nice day there. Yeah. Take care you and too. happy new year. Yeah, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a lovely time. Yeah. You too. Take okay. Care. And hi to Lydia as well. <laughs> I will. I'm signing off now. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Pleasure. <laughs>